For more than 60 years, a woman decided to change her destiny from a poor nurse to a world-famous jewel thief. From Monte Carlo to Japan, she has managed to amass an estimated $2 million in fortune and to purchase expensive items from the most beautiful and luxurious boutiques in the world. How did this poor nurse become famous and how did she plan the robbery? Stick around to find out. But before we start, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Growing up in the 1930s in a segregated coal mining country in West Virginia that offered African Americans no real chance of achieving the American dream, Doris Payne played a game she called Miss Lady. She wore a hat and a purse and imagined herself living a life far from her own impoverished circumstances. This ability to cast herself as someone else would prove a lucrative one and take her from a child playing to one of the world's most jewel thieves and career criminals. Payne was the daughter of a Cherokee mother and an illiterate African-American father. She was the youngest of five children and the most protective of her mother, who was physically abused by her father. This experience seems to have had a profound influence on her. Those things can set in the mind of a young girl. I'm never going to be under the thumb of a man, I'm gonna be the judge of my own destiny, she said. Her parents' unhappy marriage was at least partly responsible for Payne's life of crime. When Doris was in her early teens, a jewelry store owner threw her out of his shop. When he saw a white customer entering the store, he didn't want another customer to see him treating a black person in kind fashion. She used to cry about it and felt like she was just nothing. After this incident, she began to enter stores, take a piece of jewelry, stop at the exit and shout back, you forgot this one, to tent and embarrass the shopkeepers. When she found a job in Cleveland, working as a hospital nurse, she would take trips to Pittsburgh, where she stole her first diamond in Pittsburgh and gave her mother the cash to get out of town. She stuck with it when she saw how easy it was to do, consequently, she got very good at it. Doris's methods are as intriguing as her motives, revealing her intimate knowledge about creating expectations of trustworthiness that allow her to steal without difficulty. Her techniques are shown via reenactments. In her social role, she dresses in expensive clothing and jewelry. Jewelers spread several pieces of jewelry on a countertop in front of her. Then she starts her sleight of hand game, moving them around, wearing them, moving them around at a dizzying pace, then distracting the sales clerk who will look away. She grabs one, she will then ask where that particular piece is. As they look about for the jewelry, Doris will then discover it and give it back to the jeweler. This is how she earns the trust of the jewelers. Her first big score happened in 1952 when she was just 23. Payne walked out of a Pittsburgh jewelry store with a diamond ring valued at $20,000. But she was so paranoid that she had been followed, so she ended up spending the night in a bathroom stall of a Greyhound station. The next day, she walked back to the jeweler store, guilty and determined to return the stolen diamond but she ended up wandering into a resale store just blocks away, selling the ring for a $7,000 profit. Payne eventually learned that a successful jewel heist isn't about luck or even confidence, it's about having the talent to make people forget. Payne writes, if they could forget, then I could get money. Though the flux of income from her crimes reduced her family's financial burden, she bought several houses for herself and her mother including a 20,000 full bedroom brick house in Shaker Heights, a suburb of Cleveland in 1966. Payne's two children, Ronnie and Rhonda, went to live with their dad whom she never married, not just at the father's insistence but hers. While she spent regular checks to cover their expenses, Payne knew that she wasn't made to be a mother. A woman practicing being a world-class jewel thief wasn't going to be home much, she writes. During the late 1950s, Stealing jewels became a Payne's full-time job. She traveled across North America from Los Angeles to Montreal, Canada and did her homework. Payne learned that if she convinced jewelers to bring out more than five pieces to show her at one time, they were shy about reporting that to the police, who would send a report of the store's negligence to their insurance company. She had to practice making it their own fault, not hers. In 1957, she began dating an Israeli with deep ties to the criminal underground nicknamed Babe, real name Harold Bromfield. When she was identified as the culprit in a jewelry heist in Philadelphia, Babe's well-connected lawyers handled it. 
negotiating with the judge for a guilty plea without time served. But photos of pain eventually hit the papers, forcing her to travel to smaller cities and towns where she wouldn't be recognized. Stealing became even more difficult when her protector Babe died in 1968 from complexions from cosmetic surgery. By the early 1970s, she decided it was too dangerous for her in the United States and she moved her operations to Europe. Her first destination during the summer of 1974 was Monte Carlo. She targeted Cartier, where she stole a large diamond ring that was her largest theft. The price on the tag was followed by non-zeros. When she arrived at the airport, the police were waiting for her. While in custody, she managed to pry the stone from its setting, throw the ring out of her window into the Mediterranean, and sew the stone into her girdle. Amazingly, despite several full-body searches, they never found the ring and couldn't hold her forever for a crime they couldn't prove. Eventually, she escaped the clutches of law enforcement, fled to New York, and sold it for $148,000. By 1975, Doris Payne had been stealing precious diamonds around the globe for several decades. But when the 44-year-old set her sights on her latest target, the world-famous Bulgari jeweler in Rome, she thought she would meet her match. The handsome young clerk didn't have that special quality she looked for in a mark. The combination of eager to please and stupid, he moved too fast, was as watchful as a hawk and didn't give her a chance to confuse him. This dude was trained like a stripper, Payne writes. She moved at a dizzying pace, putting on and taking off rings and necklaces until the clerk wasn't able to keep up. As she slipped a yellow diamond ring worth thousands into her middle fingers, he didn't notice my hand move like a snake, Payne writes. She asked to use the powder room, then disappeared into the streets of Rome before the clerk realized what had happened. It was the last in a five-day full city literacy tour in which she also walked off with a 55,000 watch as Van Cleef and Arpels, also several diamond and emerald pieces from Gerard Anko, the London jeweler to the British crown. Twenty years later, she was an international jewel thief who traveled the world under 32 aliases with at least nine passports. In 1999, she was sentenced to 12 years for stealing a $57,000 ring in Denver, but only served five. On January 22, 2010, she was caught in Casa Mesa, California after she ripped out the tax from a $1,300 Burberry trench coat from a Saks Fifth Avenue store and left the store with it. Payne was convicted in January 2011 for stealing a one-car diamond ring and was sentenced to 16 months in prison by a San Diego court. On October 29, 2013, Payne was detained for stealing a 20,500 diamond encrusted ring in Palm Desert, California. After she pleaded guilty to the charges, she was given a sentence of two years in prison, which was to be followed by two more years on parole. She was also ordered to maintain her distance from any jewelry store. She was released after serving only three months of her sentence due to prison overcrowding. By July 2015, she had allegedly started stealing again and reportedly had stolen a $33,000 ring. Payne was arrested by Atlanta police after she was seen on a security camera, placing 690 Christian Dyer earrings in her pockets at a Saks Fifth Avenue store. But the stories got repetitious, Payne would see something, get caught, tell the judge she wouldn't do it again, and then inevitably do it again. She became more inept, consistently getting caught or thwarted. Her later exploits seemed to stem from a compulsion she couldn't control. On July 17, 2017, while wearing an ankle monitor for a previous crime, she was caught by the authorities for stealing $86.22 worth of merchandise from a Walmart store in Atlanta. She was taken into police custody again in Atlanta on December 13, 2017 on latency charges. Payne was released on a $50,000 bond in that case and ordered not to travel outside the state of Georgia. Her attorney told judges in Fulton and DeKalb County that she was too sick to stand trial. Earlier this year, Payne's attorney claimed that she had cancer. Her five decades spree and 20-some arrests in countries around the world, including Greece, France, Britain, and Switzerland have made her something of a celebrity among thieves. A jewel thief for six decades, Payne was the subject of a 2013 documentary, The Life and Crimes of Doris Payne. 
The film's website describes her as one of the world's most notorious and successful jewel thieves. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss more videos of crime and mysteries and much more interesting stories. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.